12.30, a very, very warm welcome everybody to this webinar today, um, focusing on a, a topic I know um, many of you will be obviously very concerned about, um, it's clearly in the, in the media a lot at the moment, and that's how organisations tackle the, uh, the, the constant challenge, um, it feels like a real challenge for many of us, tackling bullying and harassment in the workplace. This webinar is one of a number of webinars that we run through the TCM group, uh, helping organisations to create compassionate, collaborative and constructive remedies to workplace issues, workplace challenges. So my name is David Little, I'm the Chief Executive and the founder of the TCM Group and it's great to have so many of you here today um, to talk about this topic and hopefully find some new approaches and some new remedies because one thing is for certain, the current systems for tackling bullying and harassment in the workplace, they just are not working. So let's have a look at the, uh, the webinar. So we'll be running for, for 60 minutes. I'll try and make it as participatory as I can. So I really welcome questions, uh, thoughts and reflections from you during the course of the webinar. So if there's anything I say that you vehemently agree with or, or of course vehemently disagree with, please do um, use the, uh, the panel in front of you. That will give you the, if you put your question into the questions area, I will stop at key points during the session today and take your, your questions. The webinar is being recorded uh, and it will be shared through our website and also through social media. Also, we'll send you a link to everyone who's registered and attended the webinar. So please do feel free to use this as a resource. And of course, do feel free to share this with uh, your colleagues. As I said, opportunities for questions throughout the session, and I will be referring a number of times today to the uh, resolution policy, which a number of you I know on this webinar have introduced in your organisation as, as an alternative to the traditional systems. For those of you who are interested, I will be delighted to share with you a template resolution policy. Uh, and as I said, I will be referring that, but it's uh, referring to that. However, it's lunchtime. Uh, I hope that you might have some lunch in front of you. If you, if you have, I'm very jealous. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, please do sit back, enjoy. I hope that you find the session informative. I hope you find it useful. And like I said, please do ask me as many questions as you wish. I really do enjoy answering the questions. And I think if we can run it as a bit of a clinic today, then hopefully you can get something really, really valuable from this workshop today. So a little bit about myself. Um, for those of you don't, who don't know me, if you cut me in half, uh, you'll find I'm a mediator. Uh, I've been mediating all of my career. Uh, my background originally was in um, community and race relations. My, my first degree is in community and race relations. And then in the early 90s, I went to work in Leicester in the East Midlands uh, to, uh, to promote um, uh, engagement in social and economic regeneration programmes working for the local authority. I saw firsthand the uh, negative and damaging effect of conflict in communities. So I set up one of the first mediation and non-violence projects in the country uh, that grew very rapidly, uh, promoting mediation and restorative justice across Leicester and then subsequently across the country. And in particular, one of my real proud achievements is setting up um, uh, peer mediation, anti-bullying initiatives in schools across Leicester. And the BBC made a documentary of, uh, of that work in the 1990s uh, through, through a company called True Vision. And that was about helping young people in schools and playgrounds to address issues um, conflicts, violence, tension, bullying, harassment, and so on and so forth through mediation. And whilst uh, my work with organisations, of course, everyone I work with is that little bit older, perhaps, than those early days of working in schools around Leicester, I have found that many of the behaviours and some of the issues and challenges in organisations re replicate in many ways those that I used to find in schools. And I do believe that that peer mediation and restorative justice approach can be and is proven to be very effective in organisations. Last week, I was uh, receiving the award for uh, for best uh, for for, um, uh, for best practice, uh, for best, best mediation practice at the National Mediation Awards, very proud moment. Um, TCM's work with numerous companies. I'll share some of those examples and case studies shortly. As I've said, we launched the resolution policy in 2014 to gasps. So, wow, what's this policy? Um, how could this replace our GBH policies, grievance, bullying and harassment policies? Um, but from those early days now, there are a number of organisations, and I'm sure some of you on this webinar today, who now have moved from the language of grievance to the language of resolution. Wow. And that's what it's all about, resolution. How can we resolve this constructively in an adult way?
So train managers and leaders that absolutely love working with managers and leaders. They're at the front line, they're in the trenches, they're dealing with this stuff every day. They're both the solution and then sometimes they may also be the problem. But one thing's for sure, every case that I've ever worked with, every mediation I have ever done, had a manager or a leader stepped in at an earlier stage and had the confidence, the competence and the courage to deal with the issue there and then, you would not have needed, I would not have been needed, you would have not have needed me. And that's every single case I've ever done, ever. And I've done a lot of cases. So let's we'll focus, of course, today on the role of managers and leaders. And uh, again, some of you may have uh, read, read the text I had published last September by uh, Kogan Page and the CIPD. And that set out a framework, a structure, a mechanism by which organisations can handle conflicts and disputes more effectively and move away from some of these systems and processes. Lena, you've just sent me a little message through questions saying hello. Well, a very warm hello to you as well, Lena. Thank you for your message. So please do send me messages. If you want to say hello to me through messages, that's fine, like Lena has, or any questions, thoughts, or reflections that you have. So Lena, a very warm welcome to this webinar. As with everyone, a very, very warm welcome to all of you. So want well, to just talk you through how we work at TCM. So we, we, we apply a, a whole systems approach. We've, we've recognized that our many organizations' responses to bullying and harassment, I don't mean to use the words woefully ineffective in a pejorative sense or in any way to, to be negative about the functions that we have, but the systems and processes are woefully ineffective. They are often reactive. They often require people to get into their nuclear bunkers for the for the for the heels to be dug in and for the dispute almost to worsen to a point where it's so bad we have to do something. So we work with organisations to help them align their core values with their HR and employee relations policies, using an evidence-based approach for driving the changes within their organisations. Ensuring that conflict management, change management, collaborative approaches, that's a strategic focus. It's not just being done by a good few folk, it's actually something that runs across the organization. And in my book, I've highlighted the, the number one, the, first, the single biggest issue that causes conflict in our workplaces is a lack of a strategic focus. And I've not been into a single organization yet and asked them, have you got a conflict management strategy? and they've shown me their conflict management strategy. They pull out a battered old grievance procedure. Most organizations will have a strategy for how many paper clips to order. Yet when something is as damaging and challenging and potentially impactful as conflict, bullying, harassment, discrimination, there isn't a strategic framework within which it works. So we work with organizations to help them to create that strategic framework within which these issues are being tackled and are being dealt with. We help to create person-centred values-based HR processes. I'll be talking about those today, and I've mentioned the important role that leaders play. We integrate mediation into the organisation, help make mediation come to life, and we promote restorative justice, particularly in more serious cases where there's facilitation, particularly in sexual harassment cases, and you may have seen I've published a white paper on the use of restorative justice in more complex sexual harassment cases. Of course, it's not just about the internal environment. We're also looking at the external environment and the role that these approaches can play in dealing with customer complaints, patient complaints, complaints by students against their you know, PhD students, against their supervisor, say, in a university. So it's about the external environment as well as the internal. And of course, we really advocate and promote that continuous learning journey and recognising that conflict when, it managed, when it's managed well and tension when it's handled effectively and change when it's handled compassionately can generate an enormous amount of learning and insight and data and knowledge for the organization so we help organizations to tap into that and to learn from that and in essence see conflict and bullying and harassment and discrimination not as a, a threat and a risk or something to be mitigated or passed to the lawyers when we don't know what to do and we're scratching our heads working out what to do about it it's a it's, a, it's about generating insight and learning and knowledge and bringing people together and helping people to have powerful conversations about problems that they're facing and identifying solutions and in essence that's what the model delivers a happy healthy and harmonious culture and a number of organisations now have adopted and are embedding this model here. And as you'll see, there's some some some, some big names and works and well recognised brands. Um, and are delighted again at the National Mediation Awards last week. Aviva and the Metropolitan Police, two 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 clients I've been working with a lot over the last few years. Um, 
have embedded mediation programs, uh, resolution initiatives for different reasons, um, but they won awards. They both won, they were joint winners of initiative of the year, a mediation initiative of the year 2018. And it's very powerful to see these two organizations who'd come from very different places, the Metropolitan Police, of course, so it's real, real, real challenges in relation to uh, issues identified through an uh, Equalities and Human Rights Commission report, but have, from those early days of identifying problems have now changed the way, cha transformed the way they handle grievances and complaints. Similarly, Lloyd's Banking Group, we've helped them to develop their resolution policy and shift towards a culture of resolution. Tesco, HSBC Network, Rails. There's a lot of organisations, London Ambulance Service, we've run their uh, bullying and harassment, uh, support their bullying and harassment activities, and they've seen a significant drop in the number of grievances. Uh, but Royal Mail's been a real, a real eye-opener for, for me, and I've been working closely with them. And Royal Mail um, approached me a number of years ago and said, look, David, we, we, we're having some real challenges in our organisation. I think it was well publicised, both in terms of the industrial relations climate and issues around a bullet. You, 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 may, you may recall uh, a very sad situation where one of their employees uh, committed suicide in the West Midlands and, and, and his suicide note set out very clearly, very plainly, the issues he was experiencing. And that was a real wake up call for Royal Mail. And they, they, they subsequently really looked at what they needed to do around tackling bullying and harassment. So, so myself and my team worked with Royal Mail, continue, continue to do so, um, to help them embed mediation, both in their industrial relations activities, but also in their bullying and harassment cases. And Jane Fairhurst, one of the, uh, the key drivers uh, and, and, and protagonists in bringing mediation into Royal Mail, analysed the, the impact it was having and saw that over 80, nearly 90% of cases that came through mediation and these approaches within Royal Mail were successful. And the measurement of the, the impact of that was into the tens of millions of pounds. Oh, I, I don't mean this flippantly, but Royal Mail was an organisation who knew how to do bullying and harassment, uh, but they also knew they needed to change. And that organisation, in partnership with their union colleagues, the CWU, implemented a mediation and resolution initiative, which to me is a standout case of best practice. And from an organisation which was regularly in the news of its industrial relations track record, suddenly transformed to using mediation and you know, real, real, real claim uh, of success is last year, they went into dispute over pensions, went to mediation, and we all got our Christmas cards. That would not have happened in the past. They're using mediation strategically in the organization to drive changes, to underpin growth, to support profitability and productivity. So this, this approach today isn't just about how we resolve bullying and harassment, it's how we create a better, more effective, more engaged, more harmonious, a healthier workforce. For those of you in the in the civil service, you'll 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 no doubt have heard of the Sue Owen review published uh, a number of weeks ago now. Really, really quite shocking uh, statistics coming through through the Sue, Sue Owen review. It's very difficult to 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 to, to sugarcoat the, the 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 statistics coming out of this review. And obviously, we're we're hearing every day of this issue within the civil service. And I'm not picking on the civil service per se. It's just because this report exists. I think we could look at any organisation and potentially see these issues replicated uh, in our organisations. Nearly 75%, three in four civil servants in their career have ex experienced bullying or harassment. Now we're going to look at what that means to us as human beings in a moment. We're going to think about what impact does this have on us. But for those of you who have experienced it on this webinar, for those of you who know what it means to wake up in the middle of the night, sweating, sad, worried, anxious, can't get back to sleep. For those of you who know what it feels like to walk into the car park and see your manager's car and feel a wave of nausea coming over your body. For those of you who know what it feels like to sit at your desk in fear and anxiety that someone's going to walk over to you. For those of you who've experienced this, you will know that that's a lot of people experiencing the problems that you know exist in our organisations. And what the Sue Owen Review does, and I think it's a real a credit to the, to, the, to the UK civil service, is it sets out clearly and plainly the challenge for that organisation in terms of how do we address issues of bullying and harassment in the workplace. Rob, you've asked me for, for a definition. I'm going to come to the definition in, in a moment because one of the things I think we do is we define def bullying and harassment wrong, badly. And I think our definitions are traditional, the ACAS co definitions and all so on and so forth. To me, they are wrong. We get it wrong. We miss the human impact of bullying. We try and codify bullying and harassment as a set of standards or a set of measures against which we can test 
on 51% balance of probability whether those standards and tests have been met. I'm much more interested in what's really going on up here and here. And how can we define it as a felt experience between two human beings who are in conflict and in dispute? So Rob, I'm gonna to come to the definition, but it's gonna be a different definition than the ones that we've had in the past. And let's be honest, We've been working in an environment with ACAS codes and bullying and harassment definitions and Equalities Act legislation, yet 75% of civil servants have experienced bullying in the workplace. If we put two and two together, we'll probably come up with this conclusion that whatever exists at the moment, for those 75% of people, it ain't working. So we need a new paradigm, a new language, a new vernacular to define this. And I'll share that with you, Rob, over the course of the session today. Okay, so so I mean, there are, it, it it means so many different things to so many people. Um, people receive uh, bullying as a, a, a power, a, a, a abuse of power, uh, mobbing by others. Um, maybe manager being mobbed by employees or groups mobbing one another. Confusion, control. It's about demeaning behaviour. It's abusive. It's isolating others. It's about being aggressive. People feeling vulnerable. But my experience of bullying is about how people perceive the situation, how people receive the situation and how people feel about the situation. But what it's also about is about a set of needs that are not being met. The need to be heard, the need to be valued, the need to be respected, the need for the behaviour to stop, to be treated with dignity and respect in the workplace. And when I look at the traditional remedies and the traditional descriptors of conflict or, or, or of bullying and harassment, they define it as a set of characteristic behaviours. But when I talk to people who are experiencing bullying and harassment in the workplace, they tell me it's about what they need and how they feel and what they aspire towards. And so when I bring them together or listen to what they're saying, they tell me those things that they need, but they say that the organization's policy framework is not giving them what they need. In fact, almost what people tell me is what they need, respect, dignity, to be valued, to be heard, is not only being not being achieved, the organization's policy framework is actively preventing them from having their needs met. And I think that's a really curious and very interesting position that when we start examining and critiquing our policy frameworks, the policy frameworks are often more about protecting the organisation in the event of a future employment tribunal and preventing us from, as an HR director or an employee relations manager, standing up and being torn to shreds by the other side's barristers, by the applicant's barristers, than it is about driving a culture of allowing people to talk and listen and have their needs met and fulfilled. So the policies, as I'll say shortly, actually in and of themselves make matters worse. In fact, I would say that the policies that we have in our organisations actually create bullying behaviour. I'll go as far as that. The behaviours we experience in our organisations are as a direct result of the rules that exist in the organisations. So without, if, to change the behaviours, we have to change the rules. The rules themselves, the rule book we use for tackling bullying is creating bullying. There's a huge paradox here and we need to call that paradox out and I'll be doing that today. So the, 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 the conflict that starts, it begins with this situation uh, between our two, our two individuals. They have the feelings, the feelings of their needs not being met, a sense of loss that drives emotional, psychological responses, which I've decided not to go in massively in this webinar. If you've been on other webinars, you'll see I'm a massive fan of neuroscience and positive psychology. But in essence, we've got, it's a mad professor's laboratory up here full of adrenaline and cortisol, and it's causing us to behave in certain ways. It's affecting our perception, it's affecting our view of the world. And what happens is, of course, we perceive the other person as a threat. So we adopt the position of their, I'm right and they're wrong. So we do, adopt positions or a polarity. You're a bully, you're at fault, it's your fault, you're at blame. And what happens is we overlay this polarity or this binary positions that the parties have adopted because of the defence and attack modality they adopt with a policy framework, which is in and of itself binary because the policy framework demands on balance of probability, 51% someone to win and someone to lose. It demands a winner and a loser. The policy framework cannot function, it cannot compute the idea that both parties could be wrong and both parties could be right. So the policy framework actually then, it creates and, um, oh, hang on, you are seeing the, thank you, Mary. I paused my slides and you very 
kindly alerted me to the fact that you're only seeing the front side. So I've been uh, I've been chatting away, looking at this slide deck, Mary, and uh, you've not been seeing it. So please do forgive me. So I pressed uh, I pressed play. So you should now be able to see the slide deck. Um, I will send the slides out to you. So I am so sorry about that. I could see them, but that's probably not helpful for you as my guests on this webinar. So please do forgive me. I, uh, I, I've now rectified that situation, Mary. And thank you so much for flagging it. So the situation then becomes a, a polarity between the parties and slowly the parties become more entrenched and the situation becomes more damaging and more dysfunctional. And as I said earlier, the organization demands, we, we the organization demand that you behave as badly as you possibly can in order that we can get to 51% balance of probability because we are so alarmed and scared of the Birchell test and being held accountable in the employment tribunal. So we demand you become binary and polarised. Okay, we might not say it in those exact terms, but that's how people are receiving the messages from the organisation. And of course, then what people say is, I don't want to go into process, grievance, bullying, harassment procedures, because I instinctively know it will make matters worse. Or when I do immerse myself in those processes. I know the situation is gonna become so bad that I'm gonna protect myself. So I send a 20,000 word email to the HR director, the chief executive, to Theresa May, and anyone else who might want to listen. That does not help us to resolve the situation. It's about people protecting themselves in an environment where they feel threatened. And of course, it doesn't have to be this way. Conflict is not bad. Conflict is a neutral action. It's a situation where my needs are not being met. I'm feeling vulnerable, threatened, anxious, and worried. I experience some form of a loss, a fear of a future loss. I experience some, some fear or fear of threat. And this happens in my brain. As I said, we have the fight or flight response, and that might drive how we behave. But we choose how to behave in conflict. We choose as human beings whether or not to treat the situation in a, uh, constructively or destructively. And what I've experienced is that when people are given a new opportunity to reflect on their behaviours and to be presented with new choices, that people can choose to move from destructive to constructive, from dysfunctional to functional. So conflict has two sides. Think of the first one as butter. The negative, we, the, the dysfunctional side is destructive, it's monologue, it's unhappy, it's unhealthy, it's about disengagement, it's a close mind, it's a threat. All that language is the language of bullying. But conflict can also be healthy. Conflict, in, in many senses, is a fantastic opportunity for organisations. When it's handled well, it can be constructive, it can promote dialogue, it can create happy, healthy, engaged relationships. It can open our minds to new possibilities to be innovative and creative. It is an opportunity, not a threat. However, organisationally, what we need to do is manage conflict differently because organisations, traditional remedies to conflict comprise two functions. And again, I apologise to those of you who are in the HR policy or ER policy. You may be vehemently disagreeing with me, in which case, please do put your thoughts on to the uh, screen. But the two traditional remedies are inaction and overreaction when inaction is no longer tenable. And there's a whole middle part called action, whereby we can actually do things to bring about a constructive resolution. But we avoid, but when we can do that no longer, we come down on the parties like a ton of bricks and start hitting them over the head with a set of policies which we know, we all know, are going to make it much worse. And what, I ask myself, why do we do this to our people? Why do we do it to ourselves? So let's look at how is conflict managed. Let's have a look at the challenges that we face. I've got a question here, Tejo, as well. T Taya, Tejo. So I'll come back in a moment to that as well um, about how they are uh, dealing with their feelings. So let me come back to that and I'll definitely answer your question. So the first thing to say is that we go out at the point where our people are most vulnerable, most anxious, most scared, most worried, and we commit GBH on them. Not grievous bodily harm, grievance, bullying and harassment. I go into conferences, I talk widely and I ask a really important question. It's a very important question I'll ask you now and I, ask, I invite you to reflect on this. Does your grievance, bullis, uh, bullying and harassment policy framework deliver a successful outcome for the parties and for the organisation? I've been asking that question for about 10 years. Not one person ever, ever 
has said to me, David, that policy brought people together, it promoted dialogue, encouraged an insight, it gave them a chance to find a more productive way of working, and it set them off so that we delivered the best possible outcome for the two parties. The only time that might happen is when mediation is embedded in the process, and we'll come to the use of mediation in processes. But the formal mechanical stages of the process do not deliver outcomes which meet the needs of our human peoples. They commit GBH. Those GBH policies, grievance, bullying and harassment policies, for me, having seen them work and seen the impact that they have, I would say that they are as damaging to your teams as smoking is to your lungs and heart. And that those procedures, whilst they sit on an employee handbook somewhere collecting digital dust somewhere, we might not think about them, we certainly don't talk about them very much, my experience of those is, is they are toxic. And as soon as they are bought out, the relationship becomes so damaged that it's torn asunder and becomes so almost impossible to fix. Now, the policies, whilst also whilst promoting a binary position between the parties, a polarity, and almost demanding that the parties meet that uh, binary position in order for us to assess on balance of probability whether there is or isn't a case to answer, 51%. So on and so forth, because we need to pass certain tests. What we also do is we say to our people, look, we've got the answers. Don't worry. Well, we, ha well, we haven't, but we say we do. We, we become paternalistic. And in so doing, we infantilize these people. And then they begin to act badly because of this paternalistic structure. And then the organization says, well, why are our people acting so badly? Well, we're acting badly because we've told them that's how we want them to behave. And the policy framework encourages parent-child infantile relationships between our people. We need to turn that and create adult-to-adult -adult dialogue between people at points of challenge, difference, disagreement, and, uh, and conflict. So it's very hard to have those conversations when we're having these dynamics within our teams. And organisations, the way we're structured, the systems and processes, apart from in organisations like Aviva and others, who recognise the importance of, of shifting this on its axis, permeate a culture of parent-child relationships. And in so doing, they perpetuate a culture of fear, anxiety, uncertainty. And I start to wonder, why do we do, who's benefiting from this? Who's benefiting? Who's benefiting from people being sat at home, at home watching homes under the hammer? Who's benefiting from the stress? Who's benefiting from the investigations? Who's benefiting from the quasi litigation inspired systems and processes? And I haven't figured it out, but one thing's for sure, it's not our people. You know, our organisations, you know, we're about to exit the EU, maybe at some point in the future, if it's not May next year, and who knows when, but you know, we'd, what, it's a real challenge for us. We need to be thinking about a global trading position with one of the worst productivity records in the G12, with 30% of our people feeling engaged at any one moment in time. And I heard from a statistic from a conference at ACAS that the French workforce could go home at lunchtime on a Thursday and be as productive as us. Now, I think conflict, we have to recognise, conflict plays its part. And I was disappointed in the industrial strategy that there was no focus on the softer skills and the conflict management skills that we need within our organisations to, to create productive, healthy and harmonious workplaces. But for me, a culture of avoidance and overreaction, to me, creates real problems. And of course, the costs are great. I was working with an organisation and we looked at one employment tribunal on discrimination over £400,000 had been spent on that particular case. Of half of that was legal costs. Half of that, £200,000 on one case that could have, should have, ought to have been dealt with at a much earlier stage. And according to the CIPD, over 30% of time of my manager's time is dealing with this. If you're a manager working with issues of bullying and harassment, or if you've been had an allegation brought against you, you'll know it's 100% of your time. It's all you think about. It's all like a worm in, in our manager's brains. They don't know how to deal with it. They're often not trained to deal with it. It's not in their competency frameworks. So they struggle to deal with this stuff. And the net result of all of this, well, organisations that I work with, and again, I encourage you to look at your own statistics and data, less than 10% of reported bullying, harassment or discrimination cases that I've seen in organisations result in any sanction being applied against the manager. So we go through all of this, all of these different stages, all of these different processes, weeks, months, years later, and less than 10% of cases result in some form of a sanction being applied. That's 90% of people who have the 
courage and the guts and the desire to say something, to speak out, being told, no, you're a liar. That's what we're saying to them, you're a liar. And then they leave and they take all that knowledge, they take all of those skills. That's what they hear. You might not say, we might not say it to them. We say, on balance of probability, we're unable to reach a determination for good reason, following an investigation, and so on and so forth. You're a liar. And off they go. It can't be right. It can't be right. I just find it staggering. With it being so high vis and such a big issue, such a big topic in our in, in the media at, at the moment, it can't be right. And it can't be right that we're not challenging these systems and processes. Yeah, when I go into organizations, you know, the bullying and harassment procedure, the grievance procedure, maybe written 10 years ago, it's not been revised or reviewed perhaps in 10 years since the statutory procedures were repealed in 2008 following Michael Gibbons' review. The good news is, it's not just me saying this for my experience as a mediator and a, and, a, and, a, and a consultant, people like Peter Cheese from the CIPD and others are now recognizing we need to shift away from these old systems and process towards a more, um, person-centered um, uh, model that actually delivers outcomes for people and this is a really important message from the CIPD, the Charter Institute of Personal and Development, that the time has come to shift away from a set of policies that we tie everybody up in uh, in, the, in, in the hope that we'll pass through the Birchell test, the, the Birchell test. That test has got a lot to be held accountable for in my view. So I wanted to share with you now, uh, as we move into the second half of the webinar, I've set the tone, hopefully I've set the context um, and um, set out the, set the scene, if you like. You may agree or, or, or not uh, with some of the uh, surgeons that I've made. Again, please do ask questions. Please do come back in and challenge if, if you will. But what I'd like to do now is set out 10 steps for tackling bullying and harassment. And um, Taya, I think I'm probably going to answer the question about, so you asked me, do you have any thoughts on when employees are holding on to their feelings? And it takes years for them to bring up to 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 bring how they are feeling about bullying and harassment into the workplace. Absolutely. And it, it, it that caught, it, those feelings are driven by cortisol. It, it, conflict, bullying, harassment is a lot. It's, it's it's a lot of chemicals. And those feelings. I talk to people who are suicidal. I remember talking to one lady. She uh, said, oh, "I went to HR. HR congratulated me on um, having taken notes of the situation." I said to her, I "Said the lady, those aren't notes. That's my suicide note." So people are so people are committing suicide, as they said from the Royal Mail case. These feelings build up and build up. Tummy ache, irritable bowel syndrome, heart disease, poor backs musculoskeletal issues. These play out as physical and also mental health issues, anxiety, depression, stress in the workplace. There's a direct relationship between well-being and conflict. I, the, the vast majority of cases of stress that I work with are caused because of an unresolved issue between two people. So I agree with you. And I think organizations need to be less fearful of the F word. And I'll come to the F word. It's feelings. We need to be less scared, less worried, less anxious around feelings. And we'll talk a bit about how we can incorporate that in our 10 steps. So the first one is it's it's easy to do knee jerk impulsive reactions, ones that are going to play out well with the PR. It's going to look great on a, on a front page of a newspaper, particularly if you're one of the organizations who've been uh, on the front page of, the, uh, of, 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 of newspapers, you'll have seen the reputational harm. It's very easy to do knee jerk and impulsive. But if we're going to meet, we're going to drive real changes into the way our organizations function, we need to use an evidence based approach. So one of the recommendations I would have for my clients and for yourselves is go and understand what's really working and not working in your organization. There will be, whilst I've been very damning and will continue to be of the GBH policies, no doubt there will be a lot of good things happening in your organization, support networks, coaching networks, leadership development programs that encourage emotional intelligence. So it's about scoping out and understanding what's working well so if i would suggest forming a resolution working group resolution we're here to resolve issues bringing in unions key stakeholders managers internal comms employee reps and, and others to come together say right how can we scope out and understand the impact and the, and the nature of our organization and get a handle on this issue gathering quantitative and qualitative data about the causes and the cost of grievances bullying harassment discrimination cases and I'll talk about a tool that can help us to do that, but gain, getting stories from people who've been through these processes, measuring the volume of cases, the cost of cases, the time taken to resolve issues, that can all then feed into a business case. And then we take a business case 
setting out the, the challenges, the positives, what's working well, the proposed solutions and the benefits to board, straight up, straight up to the top of the organization. No, do not pass go, do not collect 200 pounds. We're going right to the very top of this organization and we're gonna have a conversation about what's really going on. And we're gonna focus, we're gonna in a really balanced way and we're gonna set it out in a really sensible way, but with really strong evidence. And then that can then begin to filter back down through the organization. If we don't get senior management buy into this approach, it will constantly be applied at an operational level and it won't be as effective as it would be if it's delivered from a, a top down. So I'm a big fan of bottom up change, but for this, we do need top down as well. And then that can then build into developing an overarching conflict management strategy. Um, Again, I run webinars on that and I've written about that in the book about the importance of having a strategic framework. It hasn't got to be pages and pages, just a few pages about how this how your organisation will handle conflict in the future. And one of the tools that we supply for organisations is a simply a spreadsheet, helping them to gather data, running through bullying, harassment, discrimination cases. I talked about the one that we did, uh, four hundred pounds for four hundred thousand pounds rather for the discrimination situation. That was using this calculator. Um, so I'll send this through to you, but it's fairly straightforward. It's a it's an Excel spreadsheet. Um, in the in the columns, uh, you've got the different stages and phases, and in the rows, you've got the different people involved. Of course identify their, their salary, divide by 260 gives you a day rate, and then through your uh, HR policies or ER policies, you can identify historically um, who did what at what stage and to what cost. Out will pop a cost at the bottom, and I'm sure you will be as amazed as I am when you start to see those figures going from five to 10 to 15 to 20 to hundreds of thousands of pounds in the worst cases. And then we start to ask ourselves organizationally, could that be money be better spent delivering support, frontline services, wealth for our shareholders, services for our communities, incubators for our babies in hospitals, so on and so forth. And I think you know, there are tough questions in austerity in the public sector and for all of us about how we use resources. And I think we have a, we're duty bound to challenge the way that we handle conflicts in our organizations because it's so wasteful. And whilst I was struggling earlier to think of a beneficiary, a beneficiary has come to mind for all of this stuff and it is the bmw dealership down the road they're doing pretty well out of all of the conflicts in your organizations so this is the london borough of new and we've been working with um catherine and anderson and her team for a long time now about uh, helping them to embed a culture of positive resolution a real case study uh, uh, an exemplar of best practice in my experience at london borough of Newham. um and this was just the figure uh, that Catherine provided from uh, their analysis recently. So oh, this was just over the last six months, 18 cases, a formal grievance they estimated using that statistic, that analysis I provided at £10,000. So that's a, that's a cost saving just on grievances. This isn't going into the more complex stuff of £180,000. Now for any organisation, that is an incredible amount of money. And of course, when you start looking at the Avivas, the BTs, the Lloyds, the Royal Mails, then you're going from the hundreds into the millions of pounds. So the cost benefit of analysis is there. And what the business case does is it helps you then to evaluate the impact of resolution and your approach against the baseline. I'm a massive fan of evidence-based approach to chain. So move on to number two. The second one is to develop a clear code of conduct which reflects your organization's values and principles. So I often work with organizations and I've been working with, with two or three organizations recently to help them to create a code of conduct or a behavioral framework, which sets out to their managers and leaders and all of their employees, of course, um, what is expected of them and how the organization expects their behaviors to align to their values. Now, for me, the values act as a golden thread through the organization, running through the organization. And when we align our behaviors to the values, we get different outcomes. So this is very proactive. This is very much about changing the behaviors and valuing the right behaviors, but also naming the behaviors we don't want to say. So for those code of conducts that I've been developing, we firstly set out what the values of the organization are, what they mean, why they're important, a message from the chief executive. We then look at each value and identify what are the, um, the enablers, the indicator characteristics, the behaviors which demonstrate that value is being met. So if the value is about respect, for instance, it's about listening to people. It's about having open conversations. It's about being open and honest. It's about creating safe space for dialogue to happen. Um, it's about valuing people's contributions. So those will be some of the enabler or indicator behaviors. And in the contraindicator behavior, it would be 
what don't we want to say? So in the value of respect, it'll be closing people down, ignoring conversations, sending an email rather than having an, a, a conversation, so on and so forth. So what happens then is the organisation creates its code of conduct with clearly defined behaviours and indicators and contraindicators aligned to the values. It also sets out the remedial steps the organisation will take when things go wrong, because the biggest barrier to bullying and harassment is BAU, business as usual. So when you're busy, when your consultant's on a client site and something goes wrong or something happens and it becomes challenging, what will happen when BAU gets in the way? What steps will we take to re remedy the situation? And then also consulting widely, you know, using a crowdsourcing methodology, just getting out there and letting people know what you're doing. And people sometimes say to me, yeah, but David, do we really want to do that? Do we want to admit we've got a problem? Do we want to let people know we're, we're failing in this? I don't know, this isn't a sign of failure. This is a sign of strength. This is a sign of a company, an organization that takes real issues that is affecting everybody seriously. And it's opening up a dialogue across the organization saying, we want you to help us to be the best we can be. So we in turn can help you to be utterly brilliant. And that's the conversation we want to have with you, our people. Come in and tell us what's working what's not working well. And when they come in, we listen, we don't defend, and they will tell us. But they will tell us in a way which helps to drive real meaning, insight, and understanding. This is a great conversation to have. This is much better than being splashed all over the front of a newspaper with another headline relating to another leader or another management team or another organization that's failed to have these conversations, which has avoided dealing with the issues. And as I said, when the going got too tough, they overreacted and it's just blown up in their face. That to me is not good governance. Good governance is an ongoing and open dialogue. So step three in tackling bullying and harassment in the workplace is developing a resolution policy. If, if it was me, I take the grievance procedure, and I take it to the shredder and I go, Zzz, that sounds lovely. Zzz. Because one good thing a grievance procedure does do, well, it has a real value, is it creates wonderful bedding material for small furry animals. And obviously Christmas isn't far away. So if you're thinking of getting hamsters and small furry animals for kids, then grievance procedure could be just what you need to help line the cage. I'm struggling to find another value for it. If there is one, then obviously do let me know. Um, so we can then introduce a resolution policy which replaces that. So I'm not talking about anarchy. I'm not talking about just a free-for-all. It's something different, and I'll talk more about that. And then introducing an early resolution, uh, an early assessment and triage. So Aviva, as I've mentioned, who, who just won an award for that work, and uh, Anthony Fitzpatrick and his team at Aviva, the head of employee relations, app, an inspiring you know, I, I always say to myself, where, where would I like my children to work when they when they get a bit older? And, you know, I'd like to, them to work in an organisation that takes these issues seriously, where there's respect and values. And certainly, you know, Aviva to me are demonstrating all of those things, as New York Council have been as well. So building a resolution unit and promoting an early assessment. So someone somewhere is going to assess what needs to happen. Which bucket should we put this in? So come to us early. Come to HR early. Coming to HR is not a sign of failure or a sign of weakness. It's not a threat. It's an opportunity to help us find a way forward. And then provide your people with access to a wider range of interventions. If all you have in your toolkit is a hammer, then they become a nail. And I don't want to be a nail. Your people don't want to be a nail. They want to be treated as human beings. So early resolution meetings, going and having that conversation. We might coach and mentor you to have those conversations. Providing mediation support. Yes, you will at times need to suspend, investigate and dismiss. There's no ifs, buts or maybes. This isn't going soft, by the way, on these issues. But doing that appropriately, I will come to that as well. And then where needs to be a formal resolution meeting with the individual, their, their representative and the right to appeal. And that final bullet point ticks all the boxes of the ACAS code. So you're now fully compliant with the ACAS code. ACAS's position on this is very clear. You can call the policy whatever you like. So long as you meet those three basic minimum requirements, right to, to, to meet the individual with the right to be accompanied with the right to appeal the outcome. And that, of course, is at the end of the process where all of these other steps and stages have been put in to help you generate a resolution. So they will be used infrequently, but they are available to you. By the way, this has been tested 
um, by Gemma Todd, the head of HR at Imperial Hotels in London. She's written a lovely case study. Uh, she went to tribunal um, and the tribunal chair indicated that this was a model of best practice for inter Imperial Hotels. This isn't just hyperbole, this is being tested through the courts. So we're moving from grievance to resolution, from red to green, from closed mindset to open mindset, from innovation, from, from, from dysfunction to function, collaborative um, approaches, interest-based, win-win outcomes, rather than divisive win-lose, lose-lose, as I've said, as is demanded by our organisations. So there's a copy of the resolution policy. As I said, I'll send you a free copy of it out. It's a new approach. It's values-based and person-centred. It's about people working together to promote resolution. There's this triage for cases. It underpins that fair and just culture, but it also is compliant with the ACAS code, as, as I've said, there's no question at all. Um, and I'll get in the book, Lewis Silken, uh, Laura Farnsworth and her colleagues from Lewis Silken, wrote a wonderful chapter, again, advocating the move towards resolution policies. But it also provides sort as a framework document. It's not just a, a, a policy, it's a framework to help people to have the best conversations they can have when they are experiencing conflict as defined in terms of conflict, grievance, bullying, harassment or discrimination. It works across all of those strands. And they're a real benefit, so I won't run through all of those now. But this has to be better for us. And I see it in rooms, if those of you who are mediators, hopefully you'll be nodding beamingly when I say this, is you, you, you're in a mediation room and the two parties are sat there and they're looking at each other, they can barely look at each other. It's, it's difficult for them, it's very worrying for them, they're quite upset. And you get this wonderful moment at three o'clock in the afternoon of the mediation meeting. It's like one person turns to the other. But do you understand that when you call me a waste of space in front of my colleagues, it makes me feel this big. I feel like shrinking up and crawling under a rock because of what you're saying to me. Do you understand the effect that's having on me? And then, wow, boom, the conversation begins. No, I did not realize that that statement is so powerful. Well, of course it's powerful. Less waste of space, less valuable than that. Quite the thing that makes me feel. It makes me look stupid and silly and make, undermines me, completely undermines me. And the manager, the other person, is able to hear this and talk about their intentions and the reason they're saying this. And they're able to then begin to modify their behavior and language because they understand the impact of their behavior on a real person who's looking them in the eyes, square on and saying, this is what you're doing to me. Surely that's a better way of driving behavioural change than the abrogation of responsibility to an investigating officer or a determination panel who may or may not help to drive the right behaviour. Confronting people in a non-confrontational way with the impact of their behaviour drives real behavioural change. And ultimately that's what we want in our organisations because it's not ethically and morally good. That means they can be better employees, they can perform to a higher level, they can be more productive. And does that not maybe relate back to some of the stuff I was talking about earlier with Brexit and our economy? Maybe, just perhaps, dialogue and compassion aren't just nice to have methodologies around ethics and morals. They are about driving better organisations. Now, there's an interesting thought. Compassion equals productivity. So the next one is about creating a safe space. And this is about our leaders, our managers, our HR and unions working together, but also being, a, being aware, being confident, competent and courageous. And of course, the way we can do that is we train and develop our people. We need to support them to have the conversations, to be aware of issues, of not being a bystander. You know, being a bystander, I don't think people realise just how damaging the bystander effect is in terms of uh, th these issues. If I stand by and do nothing, I am underpinning and reinforcing that behaviour and I'm saying it's okay. It's okay to do those things. It's okay to say those things about that female employee, that black client. It's okay because I've stood by and done nothing. So we need to redress the bystander effect and give people the tools to act. Moving away from inaction or overreaction to action, taking a calm, adult and supportive approach, but asking questions, challenging in the moment, being assertive. And one of the things that people say to me, and I run a lot of training on this, doing some, 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 some really exciting programs, and people say to me in, in emails or in conversations afterwards, David, I would never have done this before. I've never have challenged in that way, but do you know something? It's never ever as bad as I expected it would be. 
and it yields much better outcomes than I thought it would do. And something makes us scared to, to, to act. I, 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 I'm sure there's lots of good reasons for that, but we can't be scared. We need to give people the confidence. And also, that if things go wrong, like if you can speak to your managers in your resolution review and ask them, managers often say to me, the reason I don't say or do anything, David, is because if I say or do the wrong thing, the finger of point, the finger of blame will point duh, 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 at you, at me. I will be blamed. And actually, as an investigator, an investigation, it's much harder to prove culpability through inaction. So again, the GBH policies, not only are they making matters a lot worse, they're actually preventing our managers from doing anything from fear of those coming down on their heads. So if we may take them out of the way, the heads can come up a bit and look around and see what's going on and just be a bit more confident. They're able to deal with the F word. Oh, sorry, the, um, the other thing, listen, let's give our people a jolly good listening to. And for those of you who love an audit trail and notes and so on and so forth, and we all do, we're taught to love these things, just take the notepad and put it down by your feet and look at the person and give them a thorough jolly good listening to. Put the pad down, put the notepad down, listen. We, the audit trail is there to protect you. It's not there to facilitate the conversation. Put the pad down. And then let's deal with the feelings. Let's listen. Let's really listen to how they're feeling. And let's ask people. And if the eyes start watering and it's all coming out of here, that's fine. It's okay. It's okay. Let's not be fearful of tears and all the rest of it in our face. Let's be compassionate. Because, of course, what the feeling does is unlock the key to the need. So I feel vulnerable. So what do you need to feel safer? And then by asking the questions, we can reframe the language and identify a potential solution. If we don't ask the feelings questions, we can't identify the needs. It's a very simple mediation technique. I'm sure many of us would, would use it as mediators, but it helps us to reframe from negative uh, or destructive to a positive constructive need. So avoid blame, help people to take responsibility, and then provide access to a sort of early resolution team within your business. People who are available to come in and facilitate meetings, coach and mentor. Of course, the HR function are brilliant for doing this. Maybe the, right, the real role for the HR function isn't the guardians and the custodians of pernicious process. Maybe the role of the HR business partner and the strategic HR function is to enable dialogue and compassionate and constructive dialogue across our organizations. Now, that is a really interesting issue because I think we've got the whole role of the strategic HR function really confused. But let's not even go to that one yet. I, again, I, I talk widely on that issue. So into the sort of last 10 minutes, I think, of the webinar. So um, try and move forward at pace now. So uh, speaking out is about moving away from dogma, uh, blame and um, uh, mistrust and putting something else in their place, letting people have a conversation. So as I said, for managers, if I was training managers, and sometimes the training for managers, you know, you don't, you haven't got to go in and run an MBA for managers or do them a PhD in rocket science. It's not a business. You can run a webinar like this or a workshop or a course very quick. These are the five things. Don't be, a, whatever you do, whatever you do, do not just stand by and let it happen. If you do, you are contributing it and you are making it worse. So do not be a bystander. Listen, be self-aware. Be empathetic, read the situation. It's okay, be intuitive. We've lost that ability to be intuitive because we're all told we'll have so many unconscious biases and we're not allowed to be intuitive. Well, yeah, be intuitive, read the room. Check out how people are feeling, ask questions, be curious. Help people to move away from those feelings of fear and harm and frustration towards a future need. Help people identify that ZOPA, the zone of possible agreement, based on their core convergent needs of trust and respect and dignity. And also be comfortable bringing two people together. The best mediators, the best facilitators your organization has are your managers, without a doubt. And here's a competency framework I would develop and have developed for, um, uh, for managers. And again, I run workshops on, on management development, looking at these, perhaps these more progressive, um, some people call them soft skills. I understand they are soft skills because they're not hard technical skills. But wow, these are these are these are key skills. These are important skills. So how and when to suspend or investigate? Well, of course, we have um, so a couple of questions. Actually, before I go, let me just have a look at a couple of questions. So Rob, I agree. We the finger of blame pointing down is about empowering our managers and not creating a blame culture. I was disciplined for taking action. 
yeah safer but i have broken rules okay so you, you you thought outside the box rob i think is what you're saying and it's about helping managers to to do just that and if they can do that in partnership with rather than in conflict with the hr department and siobhan you've been asking for copies of policy templates of course delighted to share whatever is uh, would be useful to you and again we provide loads of policy documents on investigations because whilst i'm not obviously in this webinar you'd have got the sense of it i'm not a massive fan of the formal processes we can't we can't ignore the fact that sometimes people's behavior is so uh, uh, opposed to the values and it's so of course such harm we have to take formal remedy but there's i'm not i wouldn't deny that it's important to stress it but i see investigation reports which make my toes curl and I speak to people who've been through investigations where they describe to me the weeks turned into months and in some cases years. And in some organisations, they almost have anniversary parties for them. So we need to get in and do it properly. Be clear what we're doing. Set up an investigation plan. The best thing the HR business partner can do is to sit down with the investigating manager and create a really clear plan from the get go. Without a plan, it's very hard to go and do it. No one knows what's, who's doing what, what the expectations are. So a good investigation plan, the prior planning prevents pretty poor performance, I think is the webinar friendly version of that. And HR then can provide that quality assurance and support against the plan. It's very basic, but you know, there's so poorly planned and disorganized investigations. No wonder people kind of off for six months or 12 months. Be clear what the allegations are and establish clear terms of reference that the investigating manager and the investigator knows exactly what it is that's required of them to investigate. Sometimes those allegations are, are woolly and unclear. It's like a, well, I'll just go in and see, I'll ask a few questions and see if I come up with something. It's, that's not an investigation, that's a, it's a mess. Suspend, yes, of course, you, but only for as long as required. You know, be really clear. Every day, review the suspension. Reduce the collateral damage. Going and investigating bullying and harassment, it causes people to take all sorts of sides and be aware of that. What's the minimum viable product? What's the minimum number of people you need to interview? What's the minimum uh, amount of time you can spend to get to 51% balance of probability? You don't have to go and interview a team of 20 people of whom 19 are saying exactly the same as one of the individuals. That is just gonna be corrosive and damaging. So think about that in the plan. What's the MVP? Be thorough, robust, rigorous, and fair. And most cases, as I've already said, do not result in a dismissal. It's, whilst the individual might feel that it's that bad, they should, these, the manager deserves to be dismissed, the manager will mitigate, there will be other factors to consider, and the chances are you will not dismiss in the vast majority of ca cases. So be clear, how will you re reintegrate the parties? The worst thing that could happen is on Tuesday morning, the manager turns up again. The employee goes, well, what the heck is going on? And everyone says, sorry, can't discuss it. It's confidential. They've been through a disciplinary process. And then by lunchtime, they, the employee's gone and you don't see them for, for 12 months. So being mindful of that, thinking about that. So what should we do, uh, Rebecca, you've asked if mediation fails? Well, it can fail, but it's like if it's done at an earlier stage, it's got a much greater chance and likelihood of success. So it can fail, um, but we need to be able to keep people, uh, keep the door open to mediation, keep people open to the whole process. And I, I, again, I run workshops and um, webinars on mediation. I've got another question come through, Annalie, thank you for yours. Uh, so I'll come to that in a moment. In fact, I think this next one might be uh, a chance to see that. Number seven is integrating restorative justice, mediation and fair conversations into your range of remedies. For those of you who are using mediation, you'll know the incredible impact that it can have. If you're not using mediation, I'm very happy to provide information about mediation, uh, but it's really useful, very powerful for for, for building relationships before, during, or after a formal process. You obviously need access to mediators or facilitators uh, who can do this for you. Uh, and the mediators allow the parties, they create a safe space. Um, and of course, restorative justice is an advanced form of mediation that would be used in sort of harassment, sexual harassment and discrimination cases. So it's an extension of mediation. And Laura Dern, who, who um, uh, some of you may may, may recognise. Um, so she was in Star Wars. And I'm trying to remember the other program, Big Little Lies. Um, so she uh, her acceptance speech in the 2018 Golden Globes, obviously, or in the in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein and the sexual harassment um, stuff that's been going on, and obviously uh, getting a lot of media attention. She stood up at the awards and, um, and and announced that really we need to be promoting restorative justice, giving people an opportunity to come together, speak their truth. Uh, without fear of retribution. So she's advocating, as is a real movement towards advocating for restorative processes in sexual harassment cases. 
And this is what that's just what a mediation looks like. For those of you who've done it, you'll know the mediator meets the parties separately and then brings them together in a room. And then the final few slides really, I sort of begin to wrap up, is it's it's important to keep learning the lessons. Again, sometimes I go into organisations and it's like Groundhog Day. They have case after case after case, making the same mistakes, going through the same process. Their attrition levels are incredibly high. Their short, medium, long-term absences are really high. And it just feels like it's so, no, no one's anywhere is stopping and saying, well, let's sit down and look at what's working and not working. So embed in your organisation a culture of continuous improvement. You know, that resolution, that multi-agency or that multidisciplinary stakeholder group can come in and review cases, what's working and not working, and, and embed and disseminate that learning across your organisation, report it to your board, promote it to managers and disseminate it through, through your people. So there's a whole range of different options that are uh, available to you, but it is about that, so there's about the evidence base and then the continuous learning. And then internal communications and social media, of course, we know so cyberbullying is a very significant factor here. So we treat cyberbullying as, as seriously as any other form of bullying and train managers to act in the same way. So, you know, a number of times now I've gone into cases, investigations and mediations where WhatsApp messages or other social media vehicles have been used as part of the, uh, the, 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 the behaviours and, and demonstrations. So that's something to be very mindful of. Actively engaging your internal comms teams into your strategy. Uh, they will then be able to help you share your experiences with other and also help you to celebrate your successes and bring people with you on your journey. So the whole approach to embed in a resolution culture to tackle grievance, bullying, harassment, discrimination is, is, is about communicating and constantly communicating the successes to people so they are on that journey with you. And one organisation who's done this, and the research is available on the ACAS website, and this was a, a research into to Northumbria Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust. I, I, I set this project up a number of years ago, and I've been working closely with them to embed mediation uh, in their organisation. Uh, and that when we started working with the organisation, very similar to London Ambulance Service as well, they were in the lower quartile for bullying and harassment in the workplace. In 2014, uh, having worked with us for a number of years, the organisation reported the lowest number of BNH cases in the whole of the NHS in the UK. I'll just leave you to think about that for a moment. That's a massive, massive turnaround. Same with uh, other organisations. This is again driving a real impact. They were the top of the league table for the best places to one of the best places to work. And finally, then, it's just focusing on bringing people together, helping people to um, uh, uh, work together, work collaboratively to be able to resolve their issues. And there's a whole array of stakeholders who can be um, working together and have a role to play in all of this, um, helping to create a positive working culture and a positive working environment for everybody. So um, that's about the modern triumvirate, as I call them, um, the union management and um, um, and, uh, HR working together, ensuring that everyone benefits, the unions benefit, everyone benefits when conflict and bullying and harassment is managed effectively. That everyone's responsible for the culture. It's not being done to the unions, it's not being done to the managers, it's not being done to employees, it's been done with everyone working together. And then it can manage conflict actually really interestingly, whilst for many organisations it's the thing that they despair and dread the most, actually when we turn it into something more positive, it's a thing that actually can bring them together and actually it becomes Conversely, the management of conflict becomes the bit of the organisation that people really do get enormous value from and helping to create that fair and just outcome uh, culture. And as I've said there, if Royal Mail can do it, then in fairness, I think the size and the complexity of that business, anyone could do that. So we're available to help you, obviously here, sort of just promoting some, some key messages, but let you know about TCM very quickly. We're here to help. So I'll send out a free copy of the resolution policy. Siobhan, you've asked for some documents. Um, examples um, and I'll send through as much as I can uh, anything else that I can find. Adam you've said you'd appreciate anything else on, on mediation so I'll send out some documents on that. I'm very happy to come on site and have a conversation with you um, and meet with you and some of your key stakeholders. You know have laptop, will travel, 
cup of coffee, I love it, can't sit down and talk about this enough with people, so happy to come on site. We set up bullying and harassment audits and surveys, so if you've got a particular challenge and you want someone to come in and have a look at it, then we can do that. And we provide a range of services, mediation, investigation, coaching, so we can come in and, and parachute people in to do that, or we can train you up to do it, and we train to an incredibly high standard and, and an accredited standard. We provide leadership and management training for, for, for managers, from webinars to half day workshops through to perhaps more advanced courses and we embed mediation schemes of the like of Royal Mail and Aviva and HSBC and others um, so if you're interested in setting up an in-house mediation scheme and training a cohort of mediators we provide everything you could possibly need and there's our picture um, of us at the National Mediation Awards last week receiving our trophy for mediation supplier of the year 2018. So that's it I think how we're doing for time to so just over time apologies so um, but just to sum up, be radical. There's never been a better time for, for, de for dealing with this. Get those GBH policies. You might not want to shred them, I understand that, but focus them and repurpose them and focus on resolution. Ensure your values are enshrined. Apply a holistic whole systems approach. You know, strong feelings, they're okay. Work with them. Empathy is okay. It's, it's, empathy is, and compassion are a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. Actively listening and active, actively encouraging cooperative problem solving. Bring in the HR management union, if, obviously if you're unionized or, or employees together in non-unionized environments, and really investing in your managers and leaders. Now, Annalie, you asked me a question. What are the biggest barriers to implementing this new approach? Our imagination. And also, the one I hear is, oh, are we allowed to do it? What's the, don't ACAS tell us we have to do this, or isn't there some sort, no. Just to be absolutely clear, 100% crystal clear for the purposes of, of this situation, so there is no doubt, ACAS do not require you to have any of these policies and documents in your organisation. They simply require you, as you would expect, ACAS are great for this. They expect you to do the best thing by your employees and follow a minimum standard. But you have enormous space and room, and it sometimes surprises me. That, I don't know, I want to mean this in the pejoratives, but the lack of imagination that I see when it comes to, to handling conflict and challenge. We can be imaginative, we can be creative. And if, so long as we apply and follow the values of our organisation and we're using an evidence-based approach. So if we, if we follow the 10 steps, Anneli, that I've set out today, I'm not going to say it's going to be perfect. <laughs> that would be crazy. It's not. Yeah, it's not going to be perfect. But it will help to deliver a structure and a framework which will deliver results. So follow those 10 steps and hopefully, Annalie, it will work. And of course, I'm thoroughly looking forward to working with you on this project. And finally, I, I know it's so miserable. Honestly, it's so miserable. If you've been on the receiving end of this stuff, you will know this. We have only got one life and it's a short, it's short. Um, you know, be happy. And there's obviously mounting evidence to suggest happy employees and more productive employees. But let's just forget that for a moment. This stuff is miserable. Maybe we could just get out there and, and help people to feel a bit happier in the workplace. I think we have a responsibility as employers to do that. Oh, I mentioned the book. There's the book. Um, it's available from all good booksellers, Amazon, and also from Kogan Page. And we sell it through TCM as well. So if you just put in Managing Conflict by David Little, you will find it. Okay, well, that's uh, that's me. That's me done. Um, I hope that you found this a useful uh, workshop today. Um, there will no doubt be a follow-up email sent out with requests for you to give your feedback and so on and so forth. Um, I'm happy to, I, I, I'm going to stay on the line now for the next five or 10 minutes. I'm going to call the kind of webinar to an end and I'm also going to stop recording the webinar. But for those of you who wanted to stay on this workshop, if you've got any questions specifically relating to challenges you're facing in your um, organization, I'm more than happy to stay on. And I say, I'll, t I'll turn record off so you can talk to me in confidence about any challenges. So for those of you who are leaving, Thank you so much. Have a lovely rest of the day and enjoy the weekend. Um, looking out the window, the sun's shining. So hope you enjoy that and hopefully we'll have the chance to work together at some point in the future. So thank you all very much and um, goodbye. Thank you.